start with a quote, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that has honored the servant and has forgotten the gift. I found this quote um, when I was looking around for other people's perspective on intuition, because it's really fascinating how our, our brain comes up with these gut feelings that tell you stuff. And I found this one attributed to Albert Einstein, and it really resonated with me, particularly slightly ominous part that I think was never as timely as today in a world where we are deeply enamored with AI, machine learning, and all things data. I remember, I'm the first one to plead guilty. I fell in love with data as a 21-year-old, socially awkward um, exchange student in Boulder, Colorado. During high school, I had no idea what to do with my life. I was good at math, but had no true convictions otherwise. And so I talked to my dad, and he said, they will use computers everywhere to study computer science, and you can do anything. And that's how I found myself enrolled in the course in artificial intelligence and artificial neural networks. Now, what was it about data? Well, for the introvert itself, it was a revelation. You had this virtual window on the world through which you could observe and understand the world and the people without having to talk to them. And the words of my dad should prove truly prophetic a good 17 years later, because not only are computers everywhere, today data science is everywhere. And I had the great luxury and pleasure to work with incredibly smart people from all kinds of industries, medicine, finance, and advertising. But as I progressed in my career, and I started teaching more and mentoring, there was this nagging thing that couldn't be taught. Something else than algorithms and math. It was this gut feeling thing. And that brings us back to the quote that I started with. Um, now I have a confession to make. It's actually not by Albert Einstein. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Which is a lesson in intuition itself. Because he was known to have a deep appreciation for intuition but he was not known to be a very religious man. And so that word of the sacred gift should have raised some red flag, but then my intuition is for data, not language, sorry. A quote I can actually attribute is by my friend and colleague, um, Hilary Mason. And she talks about this fallacy that there's some, supposed to be some tension between data and intuition, and she claims that data is a tool to enhance intuition. And I'm taking a slightly different perspective on this and saying intuition is an absolutely crucial tool for data science. And the reason it's so important is because data is extremely compelling. Many of you know this quote by Deming that in God we trust and all other bring data. But that implies there is some divine truth to data. But is there? Really? Maybe the facts are true, but often our interpretation and understanding is wrong. The rational mind is really easily fooled by data. And intuition is the only safeguard standing in between. Since then, I've moved on. I work today in advertising. Now, you may wonder why. Well, if you love data, working in advertising is like living in Disneyland. <laughs> it's, it's like this huge playground where you can do almost anything you want, and, and you can really push these technologies and see how far they work, what they can do, based on this incredible richness of data. And for the better or the worse, one of the things that marketers care about is whether you click on ads because that means that you're interested in the product and may actually want to buy it. Now, technically, 
That's a simple question. Was there an event that was recorded by the software of your browser as happened clicking on an ad? But does it actually mean that the person clicked on an ad? Now, this might be a bit of a straw man, but I do have a cat that when she gets bored actually walks over my keyboard, which is really fun if you're on a video conference. <laughs> but we have a lot of bots and fraudulent player that have written software crew programs that pretend to click on ads, and that way make huge amounts of money selling those ads, and also benefiting a lot from things like fake news that we see a lot these days. But, okay, fine, let's assume that it actually is a person. Anybody remembers last time you clicked on an ad? All right, let me rephrase. Do you remember last time something popped up out of nowhere and you realized that instead of closing it, you must have accidentally clicked on something? <laughs> there you go. So, one of the things where my expectation and intuition got concerned is the models that are really good at predicting who clicks on ads always suggest that people who are using the Flashlight app are really into credit cards and pizzas and hotels. <laughs> Where really, only the model has found is they're fumbling in the dark. <laughs> and chances of accidentally clicking up pretty high. So there may be some notion of technical truth to that event, but the reality is the interpretation of this is certainly wrong. So there is this paradox that we're having now that on the one hand side as a society, we have a possibly misplaced reverence for data, and then by the same token, the one topic that data scientists love to lament about is all the tedious work they have to do cleaning up data. Now here's the thing, if you don't like cleaning data, you shouldn't be a data scientist. That is your job. And there's nothing trivial about it. In fact, there's nothing dirty about data. Data often just wants you to understand where it came from. And it's our job as a data scientist to listen. One of the parts of cleaning often means replacing missing values. And yes, it's tedious if you don't know the age of the patient. But imagine, you don't have the measurement for the white blood cell count. Is that missing? Do you need to replace that? Or is it not there for a very good reason? The doctor actually thinks everything's fine and didn't even bother to measure. So the absence of evidence is in fact evidence that everything's all right. So in this tension in medicine, you also have a deep understanding that intuition brings to the place. It's not that data has the truth, but you need to think as a data scientist about what it means. So data really isn't dirty, it's just misunderstood. Intuition also helps you to find order where randomness should be. Now that sounds weird. Okay, let me give you an example. I have a 13-year-old, and if I come home and his room looks like this, I'm worried. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about 13-year-olds. They're not good with order. And this usually means that either he has something really bad to confess, or he's trying to beg for that new video game. Either way, I'm a bit concerned. Here's another story. Um, here's a very good friend who lives around the block, and they often hang out in the afternoon and do homework. And then one week, Monday, Tuesday, he came home at exactly 8.10. Two days, hmm, maybe that's a coincidence. Comes Thursday, he still comes home, and when I take him aside, he actually confesses that, well, they weren't exactly doing homework the whole time, they actually went to a carnival that closed at exactly eight o'clock. <laughs> Thus, the very predictable pattern of him showing up at home 
because usually teenagers are not terribly predictable. So be concerned when things are not random enough. Talking of prediction, the so humankind has for the longest time been absolutely obsessed with predicting the futures, oracles, prophecies. And there is now a field in AI and machine learning that focuses directly on this, being able to teach machines based on historical data to predict the future or to diagnose things. Now, what do people who like to do this do for fun? Anybody here preparing for the Boston Marathon? So we have kind of marathons too, not quite. The price money is about the same. About 20 years ago, some geeks in machine learning, because back then it wasn't data science, came up with the idea of data mining competitions, where they take a data set, and then they hand it out to the participants, and they try to build the best possible model. On the second half of the data set, they keep the truth of what actually happened, and then they will declare the winner as whoever has the most predictive model. So you've heard of these maybe as the Netflix prize where you could make a million bucks. So there's some money in this now, but most of us are in it for the glory. <laughs> One of these competitions was organized by Siemens Medical and was around detecting breast cancer. They shared with us the fMRI data of 2,000 patients and the task was to identify either a group of people who were for sure healthy or a good risk score, sorting the most likely people who had a malignant tumor uh, to the least. And we won this competition not because we knew anything about medicine, not because we actually detected some secret signal from this data. In fact, it had nothing to do with the algorithm what we found was something wrong with the data. So let me show you what it looked like. So this is the data set where you have a patient identifier, which is a random number. And this random ID was assigned to protect the identity of the patient. Now, anything strikes you as interesting? Well, the first thing is that this thing is indeed sorted, which is fine. But if it is sorted, then what exactly is going on here? I mean, what happened to all these people between half a million and four million? The plot thickens when you look at the other column, which is whether or not that patient had cancer. So remember what I said about missing this, trying to tell you about the story, how the data was created? Well, it turns out you really have two separate groups of patients here. There were the lucky ones with the low numbers and the unlucky ones. But of course, it had nothing to do with luck. One group came from a treatment facility and the other one from a screening center. Now, of course, if you observe that winning the competition wasn't that hard. And again, it had nothing to do with the algorithm, but there's a deeper important meaning here. This data is completely useless to build any model that detects cancer because all the algorithm does, it finds out what the average grayscale is and therefore which of the two centers it was. It doesn't learn anything about cancer. And that is an important skill for data scientists to have, to tell you that this is not working. The interesting thing here is that the model actually looked too good to be true. So one form of intuition is to warn you if things are actually looking too good. The leading cause of death in intensive care units is nosocomial pneumonia. That means while the person is in hospital, they contract a form of pneumonia that sometimes is even resistant strain. And it would be incredibly important and really save lives if we could understand how these infections work and identify people at risk. So we build a model to detect this using all of the patient information and diagnosis and medication. And the model was incredibly good. It found this pocket of people that it was certain 
would get this infection, a smoking gun. And then you looked into the model, and here's what it said. People who have nothing else wrong with them will get this infection. Now, why are they in hospital in the first place? Well, they are in hospital in the first place because they showed up on a Friday evening in the emergency with an acute pneumonia. And because of all the chaos, it didn't get recorded until Monday. So the timestamp of the diagnosis wasn't the timestamp of the diagnosis, but when a person actually got around to type into the system. And now it looked as if they actually contracted it while they were in hospital. So the lesson here is if your model is too good to be true, maybe you want to go back and check the data. But it also means in the bigger picture that the models we built and all of these AIs are really only as good as the data intuition of their creators. And they are only too human. When you look at, for instance, modern culture themes like person of interest, there is a machine here that can tell with certainty who in the next 24 hours will die of a violent death. And this is science fiction today and will always be. These machines will never get that good. And not just because we aren't that good. But in fact, I refuse to believe that the world will ever be predictable. Because I do wish to believe in the power of free will. And if I can decide what to do with my next 24 hours, there will always be limits to what we can predict. But that poses a different question. If they aren't perfect, when shall we trust them with our lives? Now, even if they're not perfect, they're pretty damn good. They have beaten us in chess, Jeopardy, <laughs> poker. Turns out poker players think that they are not predictable. In fact, they are. But if you know what to look for, or if a machine knows what to look for. And today, even our current versions of self-driving cars are a lot better than the average teenage driver. <laughs> so three years from now, I will sleep very well. <laughs> when my son comes home in a self-driving car, even if on occasion, accidentally, it breaks for a trash bag because it thought it was a cat. Thank you. <laughs>